All right, this is session number two. We're on a roll, two of 22. And uh, in our syllabus, we are on page nine. We're dealing with several introductory matters relating to the gift of prophecy. We answered the question, what is the testimony of Jesus? Uh, we also answered the question, why is the gift called the spirit of prophecy? We dealt with why the gift is called the testimony of Jesus. We also referred to, uh, to the issue of to whom the gift of prophecy is given, and why did God give this gift to the church? Can a woman be a prophet? Did the gift of prophecy end in biblical times? Is there such a thing as a prophet who never wrote a book of the Bible? And how does God consider uh, the situation where an individual rejects the uh, gift of prophecy that God has given. Now in our next section, which is very short before we go to our next uh, study, uh, we deal with the purpose of the gift. Not only the purpose of the gift of prophecy, but also the purpose of all of the spiritual gifts. That is to bring about unity in the church. The purpose of the gift of prophecy is to unite the church. And you can find that in, in Ephesians chapter 4, and verses 11 through 15. And I do want to read this statement from Selected Messages, volume 1, page 48, where Ellen White is describing the importance of the gift of prophecy in the end time, and the dangers of uh, rejecting or even neglecting it. Uh, this is how it reads, Satan is constantly pressing in the spurious, that means the false, to lead away from the truth, the very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Satan will work ingeniously, in different ways and through different agencies, to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies which is satanic. The workings of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of the churches in them. For this reason, Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls in his delusions if the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded. So the devil is targeting the spirit of prophecy, and in our next study we're going to notice that the Bible predicted that this would happen because we're told in Revelation 12, 17 that the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed because they keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which we noticed is the gift of prophecy. The devil hates the commandments of God and he hates the gifts of prophecy because the gift of prophecy points to the commandments of God. We're going to study that. Now the reason I chose the title for this class, Believe His Prophets, is because of a story that we find in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and this is at the foot of page 9 of your syllabus. I just want to review the, the main points of this story. In uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 1, a message was brought to King Jehoshaphat that a triple alliance of enemies was coming against Judah. And Jehoshaphat, of course, was very concerned about this enemy that was coming to attack Judah. And so, according to um, 2 Chronicles 20, verses 3 and 4, Jehoshaphat consulted the Lord. And after consulting the Lord, he proclaimed a fast among God's people. And then we find in chapter 20, verses 5 through 12, a long intercessory prayer that is raised up Je by Jehoshaphat to God for God to spare His people from the onslaught of their enemies. And we're told in verses 14 through 19 that a prophet arose and instructed Judah on how they should face the enemy. The prophet said, you don't have to fight. All you have to do is go out and sing praises to the Lord. <laughs> now Israel could have said, that's the most ridiculous military counsel that we have ever heard. 
go out and sing? You've got to be kidding. We've got to fight these guys. But the Bible says that they believed God's prophet. And as a result of believing God's prophet, they were delivered from their enemies. In fact, their enemies started killing one another. They became confused. I want to read chapter 20 and verse 20, where this prophet says, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe His prophets, and you shall prosper. That's where the title for this particular class comes from, Believe His Prophets. God's people will prosper if they follow the counsel of the prophet. If they don't, the church will fall into confusion and disunity and will ultimately lose its identity. And so we must believe God's prophet that God has raised up for these last days. Now let's go to page 11 in our syllabus. And uh, we're going to take a look at the end time gift, when, where, and to whom this gift was going to be given. We begin by stating that the Bible tells us that in the end time there will be false prophets. Now uh, does it make sense that if there are going to be false prophets there must be also the true prophetic gift? Of course, because the devil only counterfeits that which God has true. How many of you have ever seen a counterfeit $4 bill? Nobody has. I've seen the counterfeit three with Bill Clinton's face on it. But there's no counterfeit $4 bill. Why is there no counterfeit $4 bill? Because there is no genuine $4 bill. So if there are false prophets, it's because God is going to have the true prophetic gift in His church. Let's notice some of those verses that speak about false prophets in the end time. Matthew 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Interesting, isn't it? What does a sheep represent in Scripture? Jesus. So they're coming in the name of Jesus. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. That's very similar to a text in Revelation chapter 13 verse 11, where it says that there's a beast that rises from the earth, it has two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. And we'll come to that a little bit later on. Matthew 24 verse 24 also states that in the end time there will be false prophets. It says there, and Jesus is speaking, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even whom? The elect. So who are false prophets targeting? They are targeting the very elect. If possible, they want to deceive the very elect. So is it important for the elect to be able to detect a false prophet and distinguish a false prophet from a genuine one? Absolutely. Now the question is, how do we distinguish between the genuine and the counterfeit? The Apostle Paul has some wise counsel in 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 20 and 21. He says, do not quench what? The Spirit, because the Spirit is involved in the gift of prophecy. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise what? Prophecies. But then he goes on to say, test all things. Would that include the gift of prophecy? Yes. Test all things. Hold fast to that which is good. So we must test a prophet to see if that prophet is really a genuine and a true prophet. Now let's read this note which will introduce what we're going to look at in the next several minutes. One way of testing whether an end time prophet is genuine or counterfeit is to determine from biblical chronology when and where the end time prophetic gift of prophecy would appear and what would characterize those who would receive it. 
So one way of determining if a, God has raised up a true prophet in the end time is to determine by prophetic chronology if that gift arose when it was supposed to arise, where it was supposed to arise, and it was given to the people that are predicted in Bible prophecy to receive it. Are you with me? And so that's what we're going to deal with next. So we're on page 12 of our syllabus. The books of Daniel and Revelation provide a sequence of events that clearly delineate where, when, and to whom the gift of prophecy would be restored in the time of the end. So let's take a look at the sequence of events that occur before the gift is restored to the end time church. And we're going to take a look at three biblical passages. We're going to take a look at Daniel 7, Revelation 12, and then at the very end we're going to take a look at Revelation 13 to, to determine the sequence of when, where, and to whom the gift of prophecy would be given. Now much of this stuff is review, so I'm going to go over it quickly. Uh, we need to think structurally, we need to think in terms of order. Let's take a look at Daniel 7's perspective. In Daniel chapter 7 we have a sequence of four beasts. The first beast is a lion, the second beast is a bear, the third beast is a leopard. As Adventists we all know that the lion represents Babylon, 605 to 539 BC. We know that the bear represents the Medes and the Persians, 539 to 331 BC. We all know that the leopard represents Greece, 331 BC to 168 BC. Those are the first three beasts, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. But then we have a fourth beast. This is a dragon beast. And this dragon beast has three consecutive stages of dominion in Daniel chapter 7. Three clear stages of dominion. There's a fourth, it doesn't come forth clearly in Daniel 7, but in Revelation chapter 13 it comes out very clearly, and we'll come to that a little bit later. This fourth beast represents what kingdom? This dragon beast represents Rome. And in Daniel 7 Rome has three stages, three consecutive stages of dominion. You say, what are those three stages? Well, in Daniel 7, 23 and 24, it describes the three stages. First of all, the dragon rules by itself for a period of time, without any horns on its head. Then, at some stage later on in its existence, we're told that it sprouts ten, ten horns. This is still Rome because the horns are on the head of the fourth beast which is Rome. But the ten horns represent that Rome was going to be what? Was going to be a divided kingdom, was going to be divided, and that happened when the barbarians invaded from the northern sector of the Roman Empire. So the first stage is this dragon beast ruling by itself. And then it says that from this kingdom, from this kingdom would come ten kingdoms, which happened historically. That's the second stage. And then there's a third stage, which is that among the ten horns rises a what? A little horn. And this little horn, according to Daniel 7 verse 25, we'll read that uh, particular ver verse, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend, this is the phrase that I want us to especially focus on, the little horn would intend or would think to change what? Times and law. Two things, times and law. So the little horn would think to change two things, times and law. And then the period of its dominion is described. It continues saying, then the saints shall be given into his hand for how long? For a time and times and half a time. So basically in Daniel 7 we have moved from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to the Roman Empire to the divided Roman Empire 
to the period of the papacy, 538 to 1798. In Daniel 7 we've moved from the days of Babylon all the way to 1798. And we've noticed that the little horn thought that it could change the times, God's times, and God's law. Is that clear? The sequence? Okay. Now let's go to the chronological sequence of Revelation chapter 12. And you'll find first of all a summary of the chapter and then we're going to actually read the verses. Revelation chapter 12 have, has several historical stages. You'll notice there at the bottom of page 12, 31 AD, Revelation chapter 12 begins in the Old Testament. You say, how do we know that Revelation 12 begins in the Old Testament? It's very simple. John sees this woman, and this woman is pregnant. The child hasn't been born yet. Who is the child that's in her womb? It's Christ. It's Jesus. Now let me ask you a dumb question to make a point. Who exists first, the woman or the child? I'm talking according to Revelation 12 now. We know, we're not talking about His pre-existence, <laughs> we're talking about His incarnation. <laughs> but I see your mind is sharp, hallelujah, praise the Lord. i got to be more careful with this guy over here. <laughs> the woman existed before the child is incarnated, right? So what would the woman represent that brings the child into the world? The woman represents God's Old Testament church at this stage before the child is born. By the way, she also represents the New Testament church because later on she has to flee to the wilderness for 1260 years. This cannot be a literal woman. <laughs> because a literal, you're talking about before Christ is born and 1260 years. It's not talking primarily about Mary. The woman represents in Revelation 12 verse 1 the Old Testament church. So where does Revelation 12 begin? It begins in the Old Testament period. And then the next stage, you'll notice at the very bottom of the page, same year, 30, uh, uh, actually this should be the year um, 31, no this isn't the year 31 AD is it? Yeah it is the year 31 AD. Okay, the dragon seeks to do what? Seeks to kill the child. Now what kingdom is that that seeks to kill the child? Rome. Is it the same thing as the fourth beast? Is it the same thing as the fourth beast? Yes, the same as the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7, correct? And so where are you in Revelation chapter 12? It began in the Old Testament period, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, and it continues with the fourth beast just like Daniel 7. It continues with the dragon who wants to kill the child. By the way, that's not the year 31 AD, that should be the year of the birth of Christ. So you need to make that correction there. The next point is the year 31 AD. Notice the next point at the top of page 13. Who won in this battle when the child is born? Was the dragon able to kill the child? No. The child grew up, he had a ministry, and what happened at the end of his ministry? He was killed, right? But was that the end of the story? No. no, because we're told that this child ascended to God into His throne. That's happening in the year 31. The man-child ascends to God into His throne in heaven after Christ's ministry on earth. He ascends to heaven. Is this still during the period of the Roman Empire? Yes. And then, uh, you know, something else that appears there in Revelation chapter 12 is the heavenly universe celebrates when He arrives in heaven. There's joy and celebration. This is found in verses 10 through 12. And then you'll notice in Revelation chapter 12 that you have the 1260 year period. The woman flees to the wilderness for 1260 years. Is that the same period of the little horn? So are you noticing that we're following the same sequence? You have the Old Testament period, Babylon, Medo, Persia, and Greece, then in Revelation chapter 12 you have the dragon, that's the same as the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7, and the dragon beast tries to kill the child, you have much more detail now in Revelation 12 than you had in Daniel chapter 7, tries to kill the child, he's not successful, the child has a ministry, 
and then the child is, uh, when he's grown up, he dies, but that's not the end because he ascends to heaven, and there's a celebration in heaven. We're still in the period of the fourth beast. But then, by the way, how many, how many horns does this uh, dragon beast have in Revelation chapter 12? He has ten horns. Is that the same as the dragon beast of Daniel 7? Dragon beast of Daniel 7? Ten horns. This dragon beast of Revelation chapter 12? Ten horns. And then the dragon beast that has ten horns hands off the baton to the dragon and hands off the baton to the little horn in Daniel chapter 7. The dragon does it in Revelation chapter 12. That shows that the little horn is the emissary of the dragon. And the dragon persecutes for how long? Time, times, and the dividing of time. And it's also referred to as 1260 years there in Revelation chapter 12. So is that the same period of the little horn? Yeah, we're following the same sequence, right? In Revelation chapter 12. And now I want you to notice, uh, we're towards the middle of the page, page 13. 538 to 1798 is the period when the woman flees to the wilderness. It's the same time that the little horn persecuted the saints of the Most High. And then you'll notice that I have here 1620. That's somewhat of an arbitrary date. It's the date when the pilgrims arrived in uh, the United States from Europe. Um, it's the time when the United States as a territory helps those who are being persecuted in Europe. The year 1620 towards the end of the 1260 years, the territory of the United States helps the woman by swallowing up the persecuting waters. And incidentally, when I say here the territory of the United States, I mean exactly that because there was no United States. It was the, the geographical realm that actually provided refuge for God's people towards the end of the 1260 years. Are you with me? So this is a little detail that is not necessarily found in Daniel chapter 7. And then you'll notice the very next verse in Revelation chapter 12, after it says that the earth helps the woman, then it says in verse 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So when would we expect the end time remnant to appear? It would have to be after the 1260 year period, after the earth has helped the woman. Are you with me or not? Amen. According to the chronological sequence of the chapter. Now let's take a look at the chapter, uh, the verses themselves, so that you're able to follow the outline that I just mentioned. In the middle of the page, let's review the chronological sequence of Revelation chapter 12. Let's go to verses 1 through 5 of Revelation 12. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. What period is being described here? You notice I have it in brackets. What period is being described with this woman who has the child and she wants the child to be born? Just like the, the Jews were, were hoping, longing for the, for the consolation of Israel, it says. This is the Old Testament period, the same as the lion, the bear, and the leopard. Verse 3, And another sign appeared in heaven, behold a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads, and how many horns? Ten. How many horns did the dragon have in Daniel 7? Ten. Ten. Ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. And by the way, this is Satan working through whom? Rome. Satan working through Rome. Verse 4, his tail, now we know where he came from, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child. What moment is that being described? His, the birth of Jesus. What empire? Rome. Who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. What event is that? The ascension of Christ. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is Rome. Now there, there's one stage that is simply uh, understood here in this sequence and that is the ten horns on the head of the dragon. That point is not amplified here in Revelation 12. 
You know, the fact that you have first of all the dragon, then it sprouts ten horns, and then you have the 1260 years. In Daniel 7 you have a clear distinction between the dragon beast, the ten horns, and the little horn. In Revelation 12 the, the ten horns are not amplified, but they're there. So we know that Rome had another stage. And by the way, let me explain this to you. Uh, sometimes the Bible will present the total picture of something, and then at other times it will present the, that there are different stages during that total picture. Let me give you another biblical example of that. In Daniel chapter 7 you have a leopard beast. The leopard beast has how many heads? The leopard beast has four heads. Now let me ask you this, that leopard beast did it have four heads at the beginning of its career? No, but the leopard is presented in its total history, are you with me? In one picture. But is there another part of Daniel that explains that there were stages to the leopard beast and then the ten heads, the four heads after that? Yes, in Daniel chapter 8. Are you with me? You have this he-goat. The he-goat has a notable horn, that's Alexander the Great. What does the he-goat represent? Greece, the same as the leopard. The notable horn is broken off and what comes out? Four horns. There you have the sequence specified, but in Daniel 7 you just have the global picture. Are you with me? And so in Revelation 12 you don't, have, the fact that the dragon has ten horns means that at some point the ten horns came out, but that point is not amplified because it was explained in Daniel 7. Are you following me? Now, so the child ascends to God into his throne, and this dragon has ten horns. We understand that this dragon beast sprouted ten horns at some point. Now what would be the next stage we would expect if this is following the order of Daniel 7? It would have to be the little horn. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 12 verse 6 and then the amplification in verses 13 through 15. It says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness. Now who are the saints of the Most High? The woman. <laughs> See in Daniel 7 the little horn persecutes the saints of the Most High, here it says that the dragon persecutes the woman. So whose emissary is the little horn? The dragon. And who are the saints of the Most High? The woman. See, you don't even have to go to Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church to know that the woman represents the church because Daniel and Revelation tell it, tell it to us, just those books. And so it says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Is that the same period that the little horn ruled in Daniel 7? Is, is Revelation 12 following the same sequence? It is. Verse 13, here's a further amplification at the end of the chapter. We don't have time to go into the structure of Revelation 12. It's, it's very intricately structure, structured, but uh, let's go to verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman. Who persecuted the woman in Daniel 7? I mean who persecuted the saints in Daniel 7? The little horn. Who persecuted the saints here? The dragon. So whose emissary is the little horn? The dragon is behind it. So it says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for how long? A time and times and half a time. Is that exactly the terminology we found in Daniel 7? Absolutely. From the presence of the serpent. Verse 15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And what do the waters that come out of his mouth represent? Multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. The dragon is using his peoples to try and destroy the church. But now something comes to the rescue. Verse 16. The earth dries up the waters of persecution towards the end of the 1260 years. The territory of the United States provided refuge for those who were being persecuted in the old world. Notice how it reads, but the earth helped the woman. Notice it doesn't say here that uh, a beast helped the woman. 
the earth helped the woman. It's a geographical territory. The earth helped the woman, and how did the earth help the woman? It opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. In other words, this territory provides refuge for God's people and for those people that go to the earth, persecution ceases. Are you with me? Now, I want you to notice, this is a little detail where you're going to see how Ellen White is so much in harmony with Scripture. The next section, let's go over it carefully. Revelation 12, 13 through 15, which we already read, provides a description of the persecution of the woman by the dragon for 1260 years. Remember we read that? Yep. Spews water out of his mouth for time, times the dividing of time, etc. Then notice this, in verse 16, the earth helps the woman by swallowing up the waters of persecution. The earth helps the woman slightly before the 1260 years come to an end, and continues helping her for a period after the 1260 years come to an end. This is made clear by the sequence of events as they appear in the Great Controversy. Now notice how Ellen White follows the identical sequence of Revelation 12. This is amazing. In Great Controversy, page 265, Ellen White begins the chapter on the French Revolution, the title of the chapter is The Bible and the French Revolution, and in this chapter Ellen White describes all of the events that took place with relationship to the French Revolution. She describes uh, how, uh, at the end of the chapter, how Pope Pius VI was taken prisoner. In other words, this chapter describes the ending of the 1260 year prophecy. But now notice what happens, the same thing as happened in Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12 you have a description of the 1260 years, then it goes back and it says before that period ended the earth helped the woman. Are you with me or not? Ellen White does the same thing. She describes the culmination of the 1260 years, the French Revolution, the taking captive of Pope Pius VI at the end of that chapter, and then in the very next chapter she goes back, just like Revelation 12 does. And do you know what the title of the previous chapter is? The Pilgrim Fathers. <laughs> is that taking place chronologically before what she described in the previous chapter? Absolutely, she's following the exact order of Revelation 12. In fact, we're going to find that the best commentary on the book of Revelation is the book The Great Controversy. It follows the same order and sequence of the book of Revelation. The Great Controversy is a decoded book of Revelation. We have a whole presentation where we're going to analyze that. It's, it's simply amazing. Even the way in which everything is structured in the, in the book Great Controversy follows the order that we find in um, the book of Revelation. So this is very similar to the order of Revelation 12, 13 through 16. In verses 13 through 15 the woman is persecuted for 1260 years, then in verse 16 the prophecy goes back in time to describe how the earth helped the woman, how the pilgrim fathers came to the territory of the United States to escape the persecution that existed in Europe. And then what is the very next point? What is the very next stage? In Revelation chapter 12. Oh, Revelation 12, verse 17. Do you think the dragon is angry because the earth has helped the woman and persecution has ceased? Oh, the, 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 the dragon loves persecution, but the earth has helped the woman. And so now persecution has ceased. And so notice the next point in the chronological sequence. It says there in Revelation 12, 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Is this taking place after the 1260 years? Is this taking place after the earth has helped the woman? Yes. Now let's take a look at the summary of the sequence of events that we find in Revelation 12. 
the remnant will arise in the territory that is described as what? As the earth. What territory is that? The United States. So where is the gift of prophecy going to arise? In the United States. It will arise after what date? After 1798. 1217 is after the 1260 years. To whom will it be given? Those who keep the commandments of God and what? And possess the testimony of Jesus. Do you see the chronological sequence? Amen. Can we determine when the gift of prophecy would appear as we examine the chronological sequence of the prophecies? You better believe we can. When you compare Daniel 7 with Revelation 12, and we haven't done Revelation 13, that's the most exciting one of all. <laughs> now the question is, what are the commandments of God? We already know what the testimony of Jesus is. What are the commandments of God? God has many commandments. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. It's one of His commands, isn't it? So what does this expression, keep the commandments of God, mean? Does it have anything to do with God's law? Listen carefully to what I'm going to say now. What do things did the little horn think that he could, that he could change? The times and the law. So let me ask you, if God raised up a prophet, what would be the primary purpose of the prophet? To restore the times and to restore the law. Vitally important. If you want more on this, I wrote a book called Futurism's Incredible Journey where I amplify this point, how what the little horn did during the 1260 years, God called Ellen White and the remnant church to undo, or to repair, and we'll, we'll touch upon that. So what are the commandments of God that the remnant keeps? Well, let's notice several passages. Matthew 19 verses 17 to 22. Remember the expression, keep the commandments, right? That's the key expression, keep the commandments. The story of the rich young ruler. The young man says, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're good. Jesus says, well, in what sense do you understand that I'm good? He said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God, but, that is, uh, but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, what? Is that the same expression? Yes, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? In case you're wondering whether these are the ten. He said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is the summary of all the last six. So what does keep the commandments mean? It means keep the commandments. Now, some people say, well, does that mean we don't have to keep the first four because Jesus doesn't mention them? No, you see, the problem was regarding the last six, not the first four. So just because he doesn't mention the first four doesn't mean that we don't have to keep on them anymore. Notice what he continues saying. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept, there's the key word again, I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure with me in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So what does keep the commandments mean? Keep what? The Ten Commandments. That's right. Luke 23, 56. Remember the women? They prepared spices. And uh, what did they do on the Sabbath? Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Which commandment? The fourth commandment. Mark 7, 9 and 10. Mark 7, because people are going to come, they're going to tell you, well, there are many commandments in the Bible. God says, go uh, teach all nations, and you know, He commands you to, to give to the poor, and He commands you, you have all these commandments. How do you know it's the Ten Commandments? Well, we have to have these verses ready. Mark 7, 9 and 10. He said to them, all too well you reject what? The commandment of God that you may Keep your tradition. The contrast is between keeping tradition and keeping what? The commandment. 
Now what commandment was he referring to? Was it one of the ten? <laughs> Verse 10, For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. So what does the word commandment of God refer to? One of the ten commandments. And the word keep is used. They keep tradition instead of keeping the commandments. Romans 7, verses 7 through 12. I want you to notice now that commandment and law are used interchangeably. Because what we're going to see is that the little horn thought that he could change the law. But that means that he would change the commandment. Are you following what I'm saying? Vitally important. Notice Romans 7, verses 7 through 12. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? There the word law is used. Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. What law is it referring to? Number 10. That's right. But sin, taking opportunity by the? Oh, so law and commandment are, are kind of together, aren't they? Produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the... See, they're interchangeable. When the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and killed, eh, deceived me, and by it killed me, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Are commandment and law used interchangeably? They most certainly are. 1 Corinthians 7, 19, the Apostle Paul says, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. So what characterizes these people who will have the gift of prophecy. They keep the commandments of God which are contained in His law. So what did the little horn think that he would be able to change? The law, but one specific what? Commandment. One specific commandment. And we'll come back to that. So law and commandments are used interchangeably. You can look at the next section. I have several examples. Let's just go to page 17 and notice Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Once again, you'll see law and commandment are used interchangeably. It says there in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Which law? For the commandments, the law contains what? Commandments. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. law. So what is it that characterizes that final remnant uh, that the devil is angry against, that the dragon is angry against? They keep the commandments of God. Which ones? The Ten Commandments of God's holy law. And the little horn before this claimed to what? Change. Claimed to have changed them. But the final remnant says, no way, we keep them. Do you see the contrast? Yeah. Now, we're going to skip the section that says, uh, we're going to page uh, 19 now, we're going to skip the section that says, um, what is the testimony of Jesus, because we already dealt with that. At the very beginning of the first session, we dealt with what the testimony of Jesus is. What is it? It is the spirit of prophecy. It is for an individual to be a prophet. We already studied that. It means that the remnant will have a what? A prophet in their midst. They will possess the gift of prophecy. And so you'll notice the four characteristics. It must arise, 
in the United States where the earth helped the woman. So the very next verse gives us the, the place. Second, it must take place after 1798. It must involve a people who teach that you're supposed to keep all of the Ten Commandments, and it has to be a people that have a prophet in their midst. Does prophecy help us determine when, where, and to whom the gift was going to be given? Absolutely. But now we're going to the next section, and this is a very serious section, and I'm going to follow it quite closely. Uh, this is actually a section from my book, uh, Futurism's Incredible Journey, and what we're going to do is we're going to make a connection between what the little horn attempted to do and what God has called the remnant church to do to undo what the little horn did. So bear with me as we go through this material. I believe it's fascinating and I believe that one of the reasons why the Adventist church in many ways is now in the wilderness is because we have totally forgotten what we're going to study right now. We have forgotten our prophetic roots and primarily our prophetic method which is called historicism. It's the historical method of studying Bible prophecy. See, we, we've used it for Revelation 12. You know, you follow, historicism is so simple. You begin in the days when the prophet wrote, and you see a flow to history that goes from one step to the next without any interruption, culminating in the end time. So you're able to follow the trajectory of prophecy. You know where it begins, and you know where it ends, and so you can look at everything in between. But if you lose this perspective, you will lose the identity of the remnant church. That's why many in the remnant church are saying, let's not talk about the beast, and let's not talk about the image of the beast. You know, that offends people. You know, let's just say that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I believe that. But prophecy shows how much God loves us. He tells us what's going to happen so that we can be ready. <laughs> Even the third angel's message is a message of love. But it's a stiff and stern warning. But it's a message from God. Now let's go to page 19. In Daniel 7.25, we find that the little horn would think to change two things, the times and the law. The change in the times was the implementing of a counterfeit method of interpreting prophecy. And the change in the law was the change of the Sabbath. We usually focus on the change of the Sabbath, but we don't focus on the change of the times. Remember God said to Nebuchadnezzar, seven times will pass over you, seven prophetic times? The change in the times, folks, simply means a change in God's prophetic calendar, God's prophetic times. Bear with me, we'll, you'll, you'll understand this even better. In order to counteract this double change that was made by the little horn during the 1260 years, God called Ellen White. I believe God called Ellen White with two specific purposes. Number one, to restore the law, and number two, to restore a proper method of interpreting Bible prophecy, to counteract what the little horn did. The historical sequence of Revelation 12 clearly reveals that God called Ellen White right on schedule. We've studied that, right? God restored the gift of prophecy in order to correct the change that the papacy attempted to make in God's times and in His law. Ellen White was not only called to repair the breach the papacy made in God's law, but also to clearly explain how end time events or the times would transpire. That's the purpose of the book The Great Controversy. You compare the book The Great Controversy with the writings of Tim LaHaye or Benny Hinn, it is like the difference between day and night. That's why Protestants are, are lining up to go over and visit the Pope. Because they've lost the times. And it was the papacy that caused them to lose the, lose the times. So we usually talk about the papacy causing Protestants to lose the right day of worship, but well, I, I'm going to show you that the papacy also, through two scholars, 
shifted the way of interpreting prophecy. And so what does God call the remnant church to do? Not only to restore the law, but to restore the proper method of interpreting Bible prophecy. Continuing, there is something far deeper in the end time conflict than Sabbath versus Sunday. At the center of the end time controversy are two rival systems of prophetic interpretation. One system denies that the papacy changed the law, that's Protestants, and the other affirms it. One system turns everyone's eyes to the Middle East for the fulfillment of prophecy, while the other points to Rome and the United States. You see, Protestantism has not, not only embraced the wrong day of worship from the papacy, but it has also borrowed the wrong way of interpreting Bible prophecy. In this way, Protestantism has made a prophetic image of the beast and has become the spokesperson for her mother, from whom she received the change in the times and in the law. See, the papacy is not only the image of the beast in terms of the day of worship, Protestantism mirrors the method of interpreting prophecy of the papacy. You know, where are evangelicals looking today for the fulfillment of prophecy? To the Middle East. Do they see any danger in Rome? Do they see any danger in the United States? Why not? Because they've lost the proper perspective of the times, the prophetic times. And by the way, if you're looking to the Middle East, for the fulfillment of the little horn, then the papacy didn't change the law. We'll come to that. Towards the bottom of page 19, the change that the little horn made in the times and in the law is intimately related, or are intimately related. When the papacy succeeded in getting Protestants to abandon the historical method of interpreting prophecy, it also succeeded in hiding the Roman Catholic system as the Antichrist. Because if you're looking at the Middle East to a future fulfillment of the little horn, then the papacy didn't change the law in the past. And because Protestants no longer saw the papacy as the predicted Antichrist, they could not discern the role of the papacy in the change of the Sabbath. Simply put, if the little horn does not symbolize the papacy, then the papacy did not change the Sabbath commandment. The change in the times then hides the culprit who changed the law. Are you following me or not? This is critical. No wonder that Protestants are blind to the central issues in the final conflict. No wonder they are oblivious to the fact that the final controversy will be between Sabbath observance as a sign of loyalty to God's authority and Sunday observance as a sign of loyalty to the papacy's authority. They can't see it because the papacy represents no danger. It should not surprise us that Protestants are looking to the Middle East for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, and even some Adventists are. When prophecy is fulfilling right before their eyes in the West, the great controversy not only restores the Sabbath to its proper position, but also clearly points out the power that changed it. Now let's summarize the relationship between Daniel 7.25 and Revelation 12.17. The little horn system during the 1260 years attempted to change what? The times, that's God's prophetic calendar, and the law. God counteracted these two changes at the end of the 1260 years by raising up a people who would what? Have the testimony of Jesus and that would have the purpose of correcting what? The change in God's prophetic calendar in the times, but they would also keep the commandments of God. What would the spirit of prophecy restore as well? The law of God to its proper place. So God raised Ellen White to counteract the two things that the little horn did. The little horn thought that it could change God's prophetic calendar and it could change God's law, and God raised up a people that have a prophet that says, no, this is the true prophetic calendar and God expects us to keep His holy law, including the Sabbath commandment. 
Now what is the role of Seventh-day Adventists? The Seventh-day Adventist Church stands alone in the world as the bulwark of the historicist method. There's no other church that uses this method. The Reformers did. <laughs> Luther, Calvin, they all identified the papacy as the Antichrist. Protestants have forsaken their own roots. This is the only church in the world that can detect and unveil the Antichrist of Scripture, along with all its allies, because this church alone has preserved the proper prophetic hermeneutic or method of interpreting prophecy. Those in the Seventh-day Adventist Church who are tampering with the historicist method and attempting to change God's times would do well to remove the shoes from their feet and be bow before the one who knows the end from the beginning. Satan knows that in order to destroy the message and mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, he must first destroy its method. The claim of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to be the remnant, this is important, is based on the historical method of interpreting Bible prophecy. We have employed the historical method to identify the papacy as the Antichrist, but this is only the tip of the iceberg. The historicist method has also been used to prove that the remnant church would arise shortly after 1798, we already did that, with a prophet in its midst. Our explanation of the messianic prophecy of the 70 weeks, the prophecy of the 2300 days, the bittersweet book of Revelation 10, the churches, the seals, the trumpets, the beasts, the three angels message, the role of the United States in prophecy, is all based on the governing principle of the historical method. Frank Holbrook, who was the head of the Biblical Research Institute back then in 1983, wrote this, the real distinctive frame holding together the picture of truth as perceived by Seventh-day Adventists is their understanding of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. In these apocalyptic prophecies, Adventists have found their times, their identity, and their task. And if we forsake that, we have no reason to exist. Are you understanding this? So, God raised up the gift of prophecy at the right time with the right message to counteract the false message that the little horn tried to implement, the change in God's law and the change in God's times, that is God's method of interpreting Bible prophecy. We will continue this in our next session together. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.